Hi everybody, it's Will Alexander from Will Alexander's Dog Show Tips, brought to you by Canine Chronicle TV and ProPlan, nutrition that performs. Don't forget, if you like what we're doing here, press the like, share, and subscribe button and the little notification bell. Well, today in the interview chair, we have none other than Canadian Dog Show Royalty, Elaine Whitney. So sit back and relax. I'm sure you're going to find her quite entertaining. Today we are here with Canadian dog show royalty Elaine Whitney, everybody's dog show mom in Canada. Hi Elaine, how are you? I'm good. Bored, like everyone else, missing everybody. Well, oh, I miss you. I was looking forward to this. I couldn't wait to see you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was 81 again last month. <laughs> yeah, I, I, have, I haven't seen, well, I guess we saw, what was the last show we saw each other at? Was it the, were you at the garden? Yep. Yeah, I was at the garden, for sure. Saw you there. Okay. Let's get started then. Okay. Tell me how you got involved in dogs. I'll try not to call you mom. <laughs> <laughs> well, I won't refer to you as my other son. <laughs> well, I bred cats. I bred show cats, and I went to cat shows, and I had best in show cats, and... When Beth was born, she was very, I started showing cats about 59, 1959. And Beth was born in, uh, no, I, show, I started showing them around 57 because she was born in 59. And she was terribly allergic to the cats. And we didn't know it was the cats for a while but it soon became evident and the cats had to go. So then, even though I had three kids and a job and so on, I was really bored. So I bought a standard poodle in 1963 out of the paper. And I bought it from a boy's school. It was their project. And I paid $20 a month for five months. Oh, wow. So I grew her up. And she happened to be from famous Susan Fraser lineage, which Biblot standard poodles. And I grew her up and I actually took her to Susan to be groomed, not realizing she was matted. And Susan put her in trim and told me to take her home and brush her out and show her. So then I went to my very first dog show, Burlington Dog Show, and Tommy Joel was judging, and my dog bit him, and I was DQ'd. <laughs> <laughs> and I have to tell you, I went to the show with a brush, a blanket, and a rubber band. That's <laughs> it. I put the blanket on the floor for the dog to lie on, and that was it. <laughs> anyway, I trained her in obedience, and then I bred her to Tall, Dark, and Handsome. Okay. And she had a beautiful litter of eight puppies and they all went to show homes thanks to Susan and they all got shown and that's how I started and I kept her for a while but she hated my husband at that time and she wouldn't let him in the house when he came home from work and she chewed up his clothes and anyway to get rid of her and I bought a silver miniature poodle thinking that they were really pretty and I could do lots of winning. I went reserves 27 times, <laughs> the same handler. <laughs> so then I had that handler buy me a miniature poodle that was really good. Who was that handler? Chuck Keel. You probably don't even remember who Chuck Keel was, but he was the handler of the time. Um, he was very good to me. He showed for Sassafras in the States. And um, um, I was really, really lucky to get this beautiful black miniature bitch. So that's how I got into this. And where did it go from there? So you have that, black, that beautiful black miniature bitch. What did you do? I sent her actually to the famous Frank Sabella to be bred. And I chose the dog that he was showing but when she got there, he didn't think that dog was appropriate, so he bred her to someone else. 
And that litter, I had three puppies. They all finished and did really well. And that line continued to do really well. And because they did really well, other people started to ask me to show dogs. Oh. So that paid for my gas to go to dog shows. And then Susan Fraser um, decided that I should show a standard poodle. And so she gave me a standard poodle called Bibelot Smart Cut. And he did a lot of winning, won many best in shows. And I'll tell you a very funny story about him. He was a blue standard poodle. Well, blues weren't that acceptable in the 60s. And I decided, shows then were from March till November. So I thought everyone will forget. So I decided to dye him. So that's when you did die with a toothbrush. And that's when standard poodles had coat to the ground. So I got this dog all dyed. And then I always put this rinse on them to avoid fleas and stuff. And it took the dye out. <laughs> I thought I'm not meant to dye dogs and I never dyed another dog. <laughs> Anyway, Susan Fraser helped me a lot. I think the next question is, who was your mentor? <laughs> is it? Yeah, yeah. She dragged me everywhere. Um, I had no money and a bunch of kids, and I was alone. And she took me everywhere. And she took me to the Chicago International, and she advised me a lot, and she showed me and introduced me to a lot of people. and. Um, she helped me a great deal. Further in the story, I'll tell you how she helped me more. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Keep going. I, al I also had uh, a mentor who was a shepherd handler, not Jimmy Moses, mm -hmm. his best friend. And he also taught me a lot about dog shows. He introduced, his father was an Albury judge, so he introduced me to a lot of people. Who was this? His name was. Brian Watson. Oh yeah, I've heard of him. <clears throat> so then he was Gary's best friend. And I went out with Brian for quite a while. I really liked him. But then he decided we should get married and I didn't like that. So Brian went and I moved on. Yes, okay. So where did we go from there then? So you were you were still on your So I was living in Toronto and I was showing dogs out of my house in Toronto and um I had a few problems with the Humane Society because I had like forty dogs in the house and so <laughs> on, right? Fortunately I showed dogs for the head of the Humane Society. <laughs> but it got to the point where it was very difficult. And Heather Logan came to me and said she had a kennel. And she and her husband were tired of running the kennel. Her husband that time was Carl Neulander. And would I be interested in leasing it? And it would be a lease for two years with an option to buy. Nice. I've never even thought of a kennel, but we went and looked at it and so on. And I agreed. And I, my lawyer went over it with a fine tooth comb and I leased Wagaway Kennels, and that was 1970. And I moved, and Gary moved with me. Ah. Right? So he had a little experience okay. with kennel work. So that was a help. You might have to explain anyway. it because so this is not all, but not everybody's going to know who Gary is. You might, you might have to say who Gary is. Okay. Gary McDonald was a professional all breed handler. He bred Vizalis, very good ones, and um, and we were married for eight years. And I worked for Gary. Too. And you worked for Gary. And he was a very, very accomplished handler. Anyway, um, so after a year, Heather phoned me and said, Neulander and her were divorcing, so I either had to buy the kennel or get out. <laughs> So my mom and I scraped together. We had to pay cash to the mortgage. And my mother and I scraped together nearly all the money. And Susan Fraser gave me the rest. Oh, wow. Loaned me the rest. 
And so she was instrumental through um, the beginning of my show career. Wagaway. Then I had Wagaway Kennels. Yeah, and I, like to me, Wagaway is, I've known Wagaway my whole life. So. That's right. Well, Wagaway, when we moved there, uh, could um, hold about 60 dogs and maybe 20 cats. The first Christmas I was there, we had 200 animals in the in the building. <laughs> I shouldn't talk about it, but we had cats under laundry baskets. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I had a litter of old English puppies in a bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> but we made money that year, and we expanded the kennel, built a whole bunch of more runs. Yep. Runs built by James Moses. Oh, there you go. He came up in the transport with them, and he put up the the runs for me. Wow. So. <laughs> I think right. I know the story. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's carry on. Okay. So we had. Hmm? I'm not going to stop you. You just keep going. <laughs> okay. So uh, we were quite uh, um, popular as handlers and we had a big business and we did look after the dogs really well but we showed and i know they don't do it now but we always had 25 to 30 dogs on the road all the time and two helpers and um we as i said shows then were um from march to november and so the kennel kept us going in between and and so on and um uh, it, we were accomplished. The kennel was very, very busy all the time. We always give people good for their money. We had a big grooming business too. And um, I had the same kennel manager for 22 years. Amazing. Yeah. And Bev Tufford, who works at the dog shows and so on, worked in my kennel too for 17 years. Right out of school, she came to work. So then Gary and I parted ways. And at that time, Bob was showing Afghans, right? I remember. And he and his wife parted ways, and he came and boarded his Afghans at my kennel. So we progressed from there. And Bob and I were very, very successful. Bob was a great handler, and we were very successful. Bob married me with six children and my mother. So he had a lot of patience. <laughs> <laughs> you guys were formidable, right? no question. So we stayed in the kennel until 1989. Or no, we stayed in the kennel and worked in the kennel and showed dogs. And in 1989, I decided that was it. That we that I had had it. It was getting harder and harder to show good to get good dogs. And there are so many younger handlers coming up that undercut or showed for nothing. Not you. <laughs> <laughs> and so we decided to go into judging. Yeah. And so um, we wrote our exams in 89, went to Bermuda for our very last show of showing dogs, and we started to judge. So the very first show we judged was Westerly with Maxine Keith. Yeah. Okay. So Bob and I were on the panel and Michelle Billings was on the panel and always intimidating to me. She didn't like me. She liked Bob. <laughs> so we, uh, we um, were out there and I said to Bob, as long as I have a really good steward, for my first assignment, I'll be really, really happy. So I went to my ring and nobody was there. And I waited and nobody was there. And I saw this man running across the field, ribbons flapping. And he came up and he said, oh, I'm so sorry, I'm late. And I hope you'll be patient because I've never ring stewarded before. <laughs> and I said, well, I've never judged before. So here we are. And that was Grant Townsend. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it was 
very interesting. The lunchroom was upstairs and we were in the lunchroom and Michelle Billings was telling Bob how wonderful it was that he had decided to judge because he had so much knowledge, so much to give. And she turned to me and said, and you too, hon. <laughs> uh, since after that, we got to be friendly. <laughs> anyway, so now it's your turn to ask a question. Okay. So I, I, are miniature poodles still your favorite breed? I love my miniature poodles, and I, can get I was very successful yes. breeding miniature poodles, but they're a lot of work. And when Annie died, I sort of lost interest in them because she and she told me what to do. You breed that dog to this bitch, and you'll. And she came to Canada and evaluated litters of puppies. And when she wasn't there, it wasn't as much fun. Yeah. So in 1986, Christopher was 10 years old, and he wanted a Cavalier for junior handling. Okay, so his fault. <laughs> Elaine Mitchell had Cavalier, so I said, can I borrow a dog for the summer? I never sent him back. He was the most wonderful dog. And Christopher now likes pointers. And I have 17 Cavaliers. <laughs> <laughs> and we still see Bob out in the ring beating everybody with Cavaliers still. So. Right. <laughs> and I'm, I'm really lucky because I was judging some specialty in the States, Cavaliers. And Bob was with me. And he sat down next to somebody. And they got to talking. And the guy said, my name is Bruce Henry. And Bob said, I'm the judge's husband. We're from Canada. And he said, well, I'm from Canada, too. And Bob said, where? And he was from Barrie. But he was married to Shirley Henry, Shermont Cavaliers. Well, I didn't know any of this. And I actually gave him the specialty. <laughs> no, no handlers at all club shows, right? So we got to talking after, and I said, I'd like a really, really nice male. And she said, I have a really nice male. Why don't you come to Texas and have a look at it? We were in New Orleans. So we went to Texas, and we brought back our first Sherman Cavalier. And we've had a really, really good working arrangement since then. Yeah. Um, Clint shows the dogs in the States, and we, Bob shows them here. And... It just has worked out wonderfully. We get along really well. Well, it seems to, and you're, you're always out there, competitive as always. So. What about, well, on the same topic of, of dogs, now, how about, um, you, you've seen, I don't know how many dogs you've seen, 100,000 dogs, million dogs, and you've also judged a bunch of dogs. What are your favorites? What are your, some of your favorites over the years that you've seen, or not, not dogs you've necessarily shown, but dogs you've seen or that you wish you could have shown or judged or owned? Or, I have thought about this question a lot because the dog that, that always sticks in my mind, probably before your time, Frank Sabella showed a dog called Hosbra Executive. And it was in Chicago and the ring was huge. And that dog just went around in front of him with a ball in its mouth. Oh, yeah. So it had its neck arched and so on. But Never could anyone else show that dog like Frank Sabella. So, though I admired that dog a great deal, I'm sure I never could have shown it. The same as Mystique. Yeah. Mystique was so beautiful. But could anyone make her look like that but Jimmy Moses? I don't think so. Yeah. So, even though I admired the dog, and I showed a lot of German Shepherds in my German Shepherd period, I uh, I couldn't see anybody else showing that dog but Jimmy. He's a master. Nobody else can show shepherds like him. No question. Yeah. Right. Any any recent dogs? A recent dog that I would love to show was Monet. Oh yes. The Pekingese of Tom Curley's. Yeah. That was a lovely dog, and I had that dog in Best in Show somewhere. And, you know, Pekingese can be 
stubborn. And, and that was the day that Monet chose to be stubborn. And I said to Tom, if he doesn't walk, he doesn't win. Well, he walked. <laughs> and so he won. Yeah. Also, a dog that I really, really liked a lot was a dog that you showed to me, Star. You actually didn't show it. Well, the Afga Afghan bitch? No, no, the Saluki bitch. Oh, oh, uh, Lucky, Lucky. Lucky? Yeah. Was that her name? Yeah, Star was the owner. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, you anyway. Gave me, you gave me best in show with Lucky. That's right, but Allison usually showed that dog. Yep. And you came in the ring because she thought you could win and she couldn't. <laughs> <laughs> but I gave her best in, show, best in specialty on that dog when it was a veteran. I love that bit. She was so pretty. So. We had fun with her. Yeah. But, but what about some, I'm sure you have a ton of them, but you have to recall them now for me. Some funny things that have happened in the ring. <laughs> Lots and lots. <laughs> so I went. One, one show that was really interesting. I, we decided to go to Winnipeg before Bob. We decided to go to Winnipeg and then on the Saskatchewan circuit, right? So we got to Winnipeg. It was a bench show. And who was there but Malcolm Fellows with the old English that had just won the gardens? Yeah, yeah. And that was a challenge, right? But the judges were Doc Martin and New Degbert and somebody else who I can't remember. So the first night, Malcolm went best in show with the Old English. The second night, I went best in show with a toy poodle. And the third night, I went best in show with a standard poodle under Doc Martin. And he asked me if I'd go home with him. <laughs> <laughs> Bob said I should tell this one because it is really funny and I'm not going to use the names but I was showing a dog had it on the table and the lady said has my husband ever made advances on you and I said <laughs> what do you say <laughs> and I said no he's always been a perfect perfect gentleman with you you never have to worry about him and she said, oh, damn, I want to divorce him, and I need, <laughs> I need some evidence. <laughs> You're going to have to tell me later who it was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I will. <laughs> so if you, if you weren't involved in dogs, a handler and, and a judge, what do you think you would have been, you'd be doing? Well, I would have been probably not nothing right now, but in my younger years, I, um, I was a very accomplished ballet dancer. Did you know that? I knew you were a dancer. I did, yeah. I, I, yeah, did. I, um, I, I took dancing lessons for a long, long time, and I took dancing lessons every single day of my life. On Saturday, I danced all day, and I actually took lessons from a, a lady called Celia Franca, who was the prima ballerina of the National Ballet. And actually the National Ballet, my mother and I worked to help it get recognized as the National Ballet. When, when we were first involved, it was Toronto Ballet. And we raised money and, and so on to make it the National Ballet. Anyway, I took my grade eight exam and I was to try out for the National Ballet and I got pregnant, and that was the end of my ballet career. <laughs> That's probably, you know, the, the dancing is probably the skill that we didn't know about, right? It is a skill, yeah. and I think it helped me through my life because I'm never, never nervous oh, in the sure. ring. Because when you danced, you changed costumes in the wings, you know, and so on. You could never be nervous. And so I think that's why. Now, I was nervous once in the ring under that same Frank Sabella. Uh-oh. I was showing a bitch that was not small. It was in Chicago. Chicago seems to be a lot of things I did. Anyway, 
there were 27 open bitches and he decided to measure. Oh, and he started, I was about three quarters down the line and he started at the front with the wicket and he went down and out, out. He got about two in front of me and he looked down and he said, that's it, I'm not measuring anymore. <laughs> but I was nervous then. After that, I made sure that anything I showed could be measured. And actually, when the CKC required dogs over a year to be measured, if they had a size disqualification, that's a while ago, I got hired lots of times to measure dogs in. So you were accomplished at it then? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Yeah, what, uh, what advice would you give for uh, someone that wanted to be a handler now? I'd first of all tell them to get an education too, because handling is a hard job and it's not for everybody. Yeah. And I'd tell them to work, go to work for a seasoned handler um, and learn the ropes and not expect to go in and west, win best in shows at the start. You have to learn how to pick up poop before you can go in and win best in show. And I think a lot of our young handlers don't know the basics. You know, they don't know how to trim a dog and strip a dog and so on and so forth. And I think very that it's very, very important for them to learn that. I remember, I, you probably remember, I was, I don't remember what show it was. But I was hanging around, this is when you, were, you and Gary were still together, and I was hanging around the setup. And one of the things I did was I left the crate door open. And some oh. of them need for that. <laughs> and then I, I went to pick up poop, and I spilt some on, on me, I think. And either you or Gary said, well, you're not going to be a handler if you're afraid, to, afraid not to get poop on you. <laughs> <laughs> the crate door thing was really funny. That came from Bill Trainer. Oh, did it? <laughs> he had a thing about crates being left open. And I, he had fired people for leaving their... I can remember him screaming at Garrett when Garrett worked for him about leaving a crate door open. One day. Yeah. <laughs> right. And to this day, I don't leave crates or pen doors open. And if one of my assistants leave it open, I slam it and yell at them. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. Because you trip over them. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you have a favorite win? Of all your My favorite win, of course, was at the Met under Ed Biven with Ziggy the Papillon. Yeah, I, I it can... was such a great win. And in those days, for Best in Show, you wore an evening dress. And I wore an evening dress that was all elasticized. And when Ed Biven called Long John Silver and me out to the center of the ring, I stepped on the front of my dress, and some people said that's why I won. <laughs> he spent a long time looking at the two dogs. They were both great dogs, and eventually I won. And that was my greatest win. And William Shatner was the presenter. I remember that year. Yeah, yeah. 1977 it was. I just wrote an article for the Papillon magazine about Ziggy and I talked, I didn't talk about my dress, but I talked about that win. Yeah. I learned there that you have to read your standards because in the Papillon ring, Ed Biven called the wicket. And I looked around and I thought, there isn't any big dogs here. Well, in Papillons in Canada, there's a disqualification for under. Oh, I didn't and know. he measured out two or three dogs. And I learned then you should learn both ways so and my worst win worst loss ever was the next year at the same met and michelle billings was doing papillons <clears throat> and i was at that point in competition for top dog with long john silver and michelle billings put garrett over me in the breed and Long John Silver went best in the show. Oh. I went in the bathroom and cried. It's the only time I ever. <laughs> anyway, I turned out to be number two. <laughs> well, 
Well, that what was my worst win. And it, it, it's funny that it was at the same show, same dogs. <laughs> Um, I was lucky to have had Ziggy, and that was because of Garrett. Well, you got Do you know that? Oh, go ahead. Garrett, Garrett actually lived with the Babbages for a while and showed their dogs and helped them and so on, and then he moved on. And um, he didn't exactly always see eye to eye with Mr. Babbage. And he came to me and said, well, he came to us and said, I have this papillon they want me to show and I don't want to do it. And I had, I think he had Betty his slip at that time and Nigel and so on. And he didn't want to be bothered with the Babbages. He loved Clarice. And then Clarice died. And so that was the end. Garrett didn't want to show for Jack Babbage. And so he asked if I would show Ziggy. And he turned out as I said, he won, he won 60 group firsts and 20 best in shows. So that was an amazing record for a toy dog at that time, especially a Papillon. Mm -hmm. And I got him by chance. Yeah, how about that? Wow. Yeah, yeah. So you, you've mentored a lot of people over the years. You can, yeah, have a I have. <laughs> Pardon? You have a few that come to mind you can tell some stories about? Well, I tell stories about <laughs> We uh, Actually, Pam Bruce was Bob's and my first assistant. Okay. And, and I have to tell you that she was a hard worker and she was just great with the dogs. Not always great with the people, but she was great with the dogs. Okay. She was wonderful with hair and so on. Then I had my daughter, Lori who was not great with me, but a wonderful trimmer. And she still, as far as I'm concerned, is the best poodle trimmer around or anything. You'd be surprised how many dogs she trims in her, that you see in the ring that she actually trims. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You'd be surprised. I'm not going to name them because <laughs> that would be confidentiality, but <laughs> it's amazing. Anyone else? When did Garrett? When? What did you do? Um, I know. I know Garrett didn't work for you, but you guys were quite close. Um, we were very, very close. Um, Garrett was difficult to get along with, as you know. He was a very difficult man to get along with, but I never, never had problems with him. He um, and I saw eye to eye, and if he had a, a beef, he said it, and if I had a beef, I said it too. And right till the end, when he was so sick in the hospital and he didn't want anyone to know he was sick. I visited him in the hospital. Actually, Bob and I visited him in the hospital quite often and so on. And he was a great loss, great loss to the world. He sure was. Yeah. Do you have any regrets? In my life? Yeah, in, in dogs. You just sport of dogs. In dogs. Mm -hmm. in, in, in dogs? In dogs? Not really. I, um, I think that I would have been more dedicated to the miniature poodles in the beginning if I'd known, like, miniature poodle to me was just a pretty dog and people wanted to buy them. And I had a bunch of kids to look after and I made money from miniature poodles. But if I had known then what I know now, you know, I... I could have had even better ones. And I had really, really good miniature poodles, but I never really promoted them. Mm -hmm. I was busy with other stuff. Sure. Well, you had uh, other aspects in the sport to deal with, and you had a growing family. So right, busy. right, right. If, what past dog show person you miss the most that you wish oh, Dick Mean. <laughs> I miss John Lusk a lot because he was my best friend. But I miss Dick every day. <laughs> and I'll cry still. <laughs> yeah. He uh, he was always there. I knew him from his very, very first dog show. And I have to tell you, 
when I saw him at the very first talk show, he was by himself. And he took me out to dinner, spent the weekend in my setup. And I thought, this is wonderful. Yeah. And he had money. <laughs> <laughs> well, then I met Dr. John. <laughs> yeah. Those are the days. I never stopped hoping, though. <laughs> Dick was a great man. Yeah. And it's too bad he's gone, but he's left a legacy because his dogs are still yeah. around and winning and being bred. So, oh, for sure. Yeah. Do you have any thoughts on the current judging progress process? Any thoughts on the correct? Oh, yeah. What are your thoughts on it, the current judging process? Well, I think a lot of young judges um, don't do their homework. A lot of old judges didn't either. When I first was in dogs, there was nothing to being an Albury judge. If you wanted to be an Albury judge, you could be an Albury judge. And then they started to have um, exams and, and processes and so on. Um, and I think that there's a lot of young people who have shown one or two dogs and think they want to be a judge, but they don't do their homework. Like Jim Reynolds, Honestly and truly, when he goes to a dog show, he reads the standards of the dogs he's going to judge the next day, even though he's been judging for how long? Yeah. And I don't do that, but I, if I have a, a significant entry in a, a breed, I study the standard before I go to the show just to make sure, especially when you get large, like, I did Goldens at Yukonuba or in Orlando last year, and I had 125 Goldens. And I studied the American standard because it's slightly different than ours before I went there. And I think a lot of people, you know, pack their bag and go to the show without thinking, well, I know, but they don't know the small, interesting, important things about the dogs. And I think you never stop learning. Oh, me too. I love dog shows, the same as you love dog shows. And I love watching breeds. It doesn't make any difference what it is. I love to watch. And I don't care who's judging. I, in my mind, judge the dogs, look at the dogs, do what I want in my mind. If the judge matches me, fine. If they don't, it doesn't make any difference. I've done my judging. And... um. That's why I'm so bored now. I miss going to dog shows. <laughs> and it keeps going on and on and on. And now I'm worried about Orlando this year because we go every year. Well, I was looking forward to this interview because I, 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 I missed you guys so much. That I, was <laughs> all the time. I was looking forward to it. And with the dog shows going on right now, I feel a little... Uh, just my show and they can't go across the border. But would you want to? I know, but I, I have my dog is entered down there, but I'm like, oh. <laughs> well, you can't get across the border, though, unless you fly. Yeah. And then you have to self-isolate and all that sort of thing. Better to stay home and be safe. <laughs> okay, Mom. <laughs> <laughs> okay. If you could talk to that 20-year-old Elaine, what would you tell her? Now, I thought about this question a lot. Yeah. Um, I asked for the questions ahead of time, so I, and if I could talk to me at 20 years old, I don't think I would change one thing, because if I did, I wouldn't be sitting here talking to you. Yeah. Uh, my life progressed, and in my life now is perfect. You know, I have a good husband, I have my dogs, I can talk to you. I can go to dog shows. If I'd have changed something when I was 20, that might not have happened. I often say if I'd met Bob first, I would have married him before all the other ones. But the first time I got married, Bob was nine. <laughs> well, that couldn't have happened. <laughs> 
if I had to talk to myself, you know, I still would have worn the same short skirts and showing dogs and gone to dog shows. And like I can remember when I had no money and we would, I worked in a grooming shop. So at, I finished grooming shows for Saturday and Sunday. So after the grooming shop closed, I would groom my dogs, load my car, drive to the dog show overnight, unload, show dogs all day, find some place to sleep, show dogs all day, drive home, go to work. Well, we couldn't do that now, no. but I did that for a few years because I had no money. I remember going to the Berry Dog Show in a Camaro with 11 dogs. <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> and that's when Barry was quite a big show. It was in the fairgrounds and so on. And I took 11 dogs with me, right? <laughs> and I took almost all hair. I did show quite a few really nice dachshunds for Ed Dixon. And, um, and they were a bonus because no hair. But I showed Maltese and Pekingese and all these things with hair. So it was an interesting, I went by myself, you know, we, I did all the work myself. So. That's yeah. a good attitude though. I love the idea that you didn't, wouldn't change a thing. Because... <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any closing thoughts for me, Elaine, to tell anybody? <laughs> well, my closing thoughts for you are, have you written your exam yet? <laughs> and I know you're going to say no, right? <laughs> you're procrastinating. <laughs> you're procrastinating. You have to do it. <laughs> you're not getting any younger either. And, and, and if, I ha if I could change something, I might have started judging younger. Yeah. Because it's a hard life judging too but it's so interesting i've been everywhere in the world judging and met so many people like andrew Briggs and espening and 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 we've been to russia we've been so many places and i couldn't have done it without dogs and judging my life as far as I'm concerned, except I'd like to be 20 years younger, is perfect. Oh, that's amazing. What a great attitude. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Elaine. I really appreciate your time today. Well, my pleasure. I hope the interview is what you expected. It wasn't the same as Andrew Brace. <laughs> <laughs> well, you didn't ask me. I, one thing that I had in my mind to say is remember he talked about Ricky and Flame, the yeah. two standard poodles. Well, I was judging poodles in Orlando, and Ricky was a class dog, and Flame was a special. And it was so interesting to judge. Ricky was beautiful in the classes, he couldn't be beaten, and so on. And I got it down to those two dogs right and the handlers both are great great handlers right anyway eventually i put up flame and after i was talking to michael gadsby <laughs> mm -hmm. and i said do you want me to tell you why he says i know why you don't have to tell me why <laughs> she is so beautiful <laughs> <laughs> but he said, I wanted to win. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> but it was funny. It was funny that that when you did the interview with Andrew Brace, he mentioned all these dogs oh. that I have judged and put up, even the pug. Yeah. The pug at the gardens. Bob gave him a best in show. I gave him the group. Yeah. Bob gave him best in show. And I thought it was interesting. Yeah that he was talking about the same dogs that we had judged and put up. We must be doing something right. There you go. Well, I, I, when I watch both you and Bob judge, you can tell how much you love it. So we, we, we do our own thing. Yep. That's for sure. Yep. 
hopefully we'll see you down the road. Elgin County hasn't canceled yet. Oh, keep your fingers crossed. <laughs> <laughs> well, he has a plan, so. <laughs> nice talking to you, Will. And uh, give Bob my best. I know he's just over there, so. <laughs> yeah. And my I'll technical talk. advisor. <laughs> <laughs> he set up the computer, the background. The background looks nice, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the fan <laughs> and everything, so. All right, guys. Hope well, to see you soon. I hope to see you soon. Yep. Great. Thank you. Bye. Bye, Bye. Well, like I said, she was entertaining. Well, I hope you enjoyed yourself here. And if you do, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe button. And if you want to talk to me or send me any messages, go to dogshowtips at gmail.com. Or if you just want to find out about what's happening in my world, go to willalexander.net. Until next week, talk to you soon. Bye-bye.